back to the FAI Wire. This is the second episode of our video series. I want to start by thanking everyone who uh, sent love and encouragement after our first episode. It's great to know that you're tracking along with us and that we've been able to encourage you and even admonish you on to uh, prayer and action uh, through this ministry. So thank you for that. Also want to remind everyone that uh, we will be in the Dallas Fort Worth area this summer for our first Maranatha End Time Summit, July 13th through the 15th. We would love to have you there. We're going to have lots of great speakers and panels, uh, a lot of great time in discussion and prayer and worship together and fellowship together. Lots of good food. So please come join us in Dallas if you can. If you're interested in registering, you can go to maranathasummit.com. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because as always, there's a lot going on in the Middle East and so we have a lot to talk about. Uh, last time, two weeks ago, we gave a brief update on the escalating violence in the West Bank between the IDF, the Israeli military, and Palestinian militant organizations. Um, that violence has been growing and escalating over about the past year and a half, but especially in the past few weeks in tit-for-tat attacks. Uh, the last uh, episode was released on February 25th. Unfortunately, the day right after that, the next uh, cycle of violence began. On the 26th, there was a shooting along Route 60 in the West Bank. As many of you know, uh, there are Israeli citizens that live in the West Bank. They're commonly referred to as Israeli settlers, only because the West Bank is recognized internationally as being uh, a Palestinian territory, even though it's the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people, uh, known biblically as Judea and Samaria. In fact, many Israelis still refer to it as J uh, Judea and Samaria to this day. But unfortunately, as uh, a couple of Israelis brothers were driving along Route 60, south of Nablus, near the Palestinian town of Huwara, uh, they were gunned down while waiting in traffic by a Palestinian man who approached their car and drew a pistol and shot them both to death. Uh, he fled the scene, and immediately afterwards, there was an uprising of uh, fellow settlers in the area who were obviously upset about this and um, took matters into their own hands. A mob of about 100 uh, Israeli settlers raided the town of Huwara, uh, burned about 30 Palestinian homes and about 100 Palestinian vehicles, and uh, there were at least 350 Palestinian injuries, mostly from smoke inhalation and tear gas inhalation, and one Palestinian man was killed. Uh, this incident unfortunately underscores the tension between uh, Palestinians and Israelis in the West Bank. As I mentioned, almost half a million Israelis living in the West Bank um, in what are called settlements. Uh, there's about 130 settlements that are sanctioned by the Israeli government and considered legal, at least by the Israeli government, not necessarily by the international community, and about 140 settlements that are considered unsanctioned, often referred to as illegal outposts in international media. Uh, most of these are very small, by the way, and may only be a few homes, uh, but they um, are made up of Israeli settlers who have moved out there for various reasons. Um, Israeli settlers or Israelis living in the West Bank tend to be more religious than your average Israeli, uh, tend to be more nationalistic, more Zionistic than the average Israeli, and are definitely more antagonistic towards their Palestinian neighbors only because of the ongoing tension in that area. So unfortunately, um, the, the raid, you could say, the, the riot in Huwara uh, took place just the day after the shooting along Route 60. Um, that incident was roundly condemned by the vast majority of the Israeli government and the IDF. Uh, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu came out on television and condemned it and encouraged Israelis not to conduct their own vigilante justice. Uh, the commanding officer of the IDF in the West Bank even referred to the uh, riot in Huwara as a pogrom, which is a shocking term to use if you're familiar with the history of the pogroms committed against the Jewish people throughout the past 2,000 years in Europe and the Middle East. Um, and he was even criticized by many in Israel for the use 
of that term that has so often been used uh, throughout history to describe violence against the Jewish people, not violence committed by the Jewish people. Unfortunately, that incident led to the next uh, cycle of violence. The very next day, a young Israeli man driving on Route 90 between Jericho and the Dead Sea was shot to death, a 27-year-old young man who was uh, both an Israeli and U.S. citizen, a dual citizen. And um, the following day, uh, the discussion continued in an Israeli society about how to uh, handle the escalation of violence. Several Israeli diplomat diplomats visited Amman, Jordan, along with leaders of the Palestinian Authority to try to de-escalate uh, the violence in the West Bank. However, the violence over that weekend somewhat overshadowed their summit and continues on. Uh, of course, the IDF kicked into gear after the shooting near Huara, uh, and intelligence found that the shooter was a member of the Hamas organization, not surprisingly, and uh, traced him to Janine in the West Bank. Again, not surprisingly, as we discussed last time in the last update, Janine has become a hotbed of militant activity. Uh, last Monday, March 6th, an IDF contingent uh, conducted a daytime raid in Janine and was able to locate the shooter along with five other militants that he was holed up with in his, in his structure and managed to kill all six of them. Uh, two of the militants were members of Hamas. Two were members of Palestinian and Islamic Jihad, which often works with Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and two were members of Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. And as I mentioned last time, uh, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, which is the militant offshoot of the Fatah party, uh, has traditionally been an enemy of Hamas and Palestinian, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And in fact, during the funeral procession for the shooter, there were members of Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades that were singing Hamas chants in the procession. So once again, underscoring that traditional enemies in the Palestinian militant community have now combined together to join forces in an attempt to make more inroads in the West Bank in confronting Israel. This led, unfortunately, to the next terrorist attack, uh, this time not in the West Bank or in East Jerusalem or in any of the border areas, but uh, another Palestinian man, again, a member of Hamas, on a Thursday night was walking down the busy Dizengoff Street in downtown Tel Aviv, uh, a busy area with lots of shops and restaurants, uh, popular with tourists and Israelis both. Um, he walked in front of a restaurant and drew a pistol and shot three civilians walking down the road near him. Um, one of those civilians was critically wounded and is Hanging on to life in the hospital, two other Israelis were moderately wounded by the gunfire. He attempted to flee. He was immediately engaged by Tel Aviv police and a couple of armed citizens and mortally wounded, died later in the hospital. A uh, couple of things about that terrorist attack that are an escalation from what we've seen so far. One of, one of those is that it took place in Tel Aviv. As I mentioned, not in East Jerusalem, not in the West Bank, uh, but all the way over on the Mediterranean coast, which is, relatively speaking for Israel, not, not that close to the, the hot areas of the nation. So um, this shows that militants are attempting at least to strike deeper into the Israeli heartland, including Tel Aviv, and um, that they're willing to sacrifice their own members in these operations in order to kill as many as Israelis as possible. The other important thing to point out about this attack is what happened afterwards. Um, just a few moments after the attack uh, hit the media, both social media and the news media, um, hundreds and even thousands of Palestinians poured out into the street uh, across the West Bank and Gaza in celebration. We're handing out candy, uh, praise for the shooter was announced over loudspeakers at mosques, and uh, there was a general air of jubilation and celebration in Palestinian communities. This is in stark contrast to the condemnation of the riot in Hawara, for instance, that took place both in the Israeli government and 
in, Isra uh, in Israeli society at large. In Tel Aviv, there were demonstrations against the settlers who set fire to Hawara in solidarity with the Palestinians. And this is important because often in Western media, international media, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is portrayed as some sort of equivalency. There's just two sides that both hate each other and both want to kill each other and both want to steal each other's land. But in reality, when you look at what, what happens when there's, there's these sorts of attacks, uh, there's very different reactions from the societies on both sides. Um, in Israeli society, when a line is crossed, uh, when there's some sort of retribution or terrorist attack, even when it's in retribution to a terrorist attack, um, Israelis, both in the government and in society at large, come out in condemnation of it. Whereas, unfortunately, what you see in Palestinian society is this growing animosity towards all Israelis and um, a hatred for Israelis that is fairly pervasive. And I'm not saying that all Palestinians necessarily feel this way. Obviously, all Palestinians weren't out on the streets after the Tel Aviv attack, uh, but thousands of them were. And it shows the stark contrast in, um, in the general uh, spirit at work, both in Israeli and Palestinian societies. So once again, the Israelis find themselves between an Iraq and a hard place where um, the international community is pressuring them to make peace um, with a people group that frankly doesn't want peace. And it's difficult to even find a, a peace partner in the Palestinian territories. The Palestinian Authority, although it's not actively involved in what uh, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades and, and, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad are doing, um, they obviously either tacitly support it or, or don't really choose to get involved, choose to remain neutral in it, and either can't or won't um, intervene. So that is the ongoing conundrum that Israel finds itself in over the last few months. Next, we move to Iran. Some of you might have heard uh, over the last about two or three weeks, it's really hit the international news, is that there's been an, a mysterious waves of poisonings at uh, Iranian schools and universities that have targeted girls, females. Uh, this began back in November at Isfahan uh, Tech University, uh, was the first incident that we're aware of where it happened, um, that multiple um, female students at the university reported symptoms of chemical poisoning that included nausea, vomiting, uh, coughing, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, etc. Since November, so in the last three or four months, uh, this wave of poisonings has spread across the country and has affected more than 7,000 girls at over 100 schools uh, in almost 100 Iranian cities. Sometimes uh, uh, close to 100 schools in a single day have been affected by uh, this trend. So far, the Iranian government has uh, denied any responsibility for the chemical chemical attacks. In fact, uh, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini has come out on national television and condemned the poisonings and promised to find, uh, to investigate them and find who's responsible and to prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. So we can't say for certainty, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the Iranian government is responsible for the poisonings. However, what we can say, as we would say in the American justice system, is that they have means, motive, and opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned, the poisonings began last November. As you might remember, the street protest movement in reaction to the beating death of Masha Amani began last fall as well. Masha Amani was a, a Kurdish-Iranian woman who was not wearing her hijab properly while visiting Tehran. She was, she was arrested by the Iranian so-called morality of police, the Basiji. Uh, interrogated and beaten and later died in a hospital, and that event kicked off a massive nationwide protest movement uh, that involved Iranians from every cross-section of society, but especially young Iranians and especially young female Iranians. In fact, uh, young Iranian women were the backbone of that protest movement. And although now Supreme Leader Khamenei is condemning the poisonings, back in October of last year, he condemned the protests and said that it was the Iranian government's job to, quote, punish the girls who were out in the street protesting uh, for their rights. And so 
they certainly had the motive uh, to do this, the, the Iranian government did. Uh, they also had the means. In fact, there were traces of some chemicals found uh, at these schools and, and then uh, reports leaked to underground media that got outside the country uh, that found that uh, the mixtures of chemicals used in these attacks are not commercially available. They would have only been available to uh, governments or militaries in a, in a restricted context. So this is not something that your average Iranian citizen or a group of citizens would have been able to do on their own. Um, it would have had to come, it would, it would have been weapons grade chemicals that would have come from uh, either a government or a military context. And as far as opportunity, well, there are thousands of Iranian secret police saturating the entire nation of Iran uh, from different branches of the government, including the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, plainclothes agents all over the country. Um, and they are really the only uh, entity that could have carried out such a widespread uh, campaign of poisonings across the entire country. There's no um, single person or cell or organization that could carry out dozens of chemical poisonings uh, affecting thousands of girls uh, in a matter of weeks. That, cam that kind of campaign could only really realistically be carried out by a government agency, government entities. So it would appear that the Iranian government, after being so strongly condemned by the international community for their very overt treatment of protesters last fall, um, confronting them in the streets, arresting them, beating them, shooting them, killing them, which led to um, international condemnation and further economic sanctions, it would appear now that the Iranian government is taking a more covert me uh, route of punishing, as the Supreme Leader put it, uh, the protesters that dare to partake in resistance against the government. So as this story continues to develop, to develop we will continue to report that to you as well. Uh, finally, last but not least for today, uh, a story that you probably missed, it wasn't widely reported, it's somewhat of a sleeper, but it is potentially the most consequential uh, story to report on today, and that is the announcement of an agreement between the Iranian government and the Saudi Arabian government. Uh, just on Friday morning announced uh, on television that both of those nations, after not having any formal diplomatic relations for the last year, have now agreed upon a plan to resume diplomatic relations and open their respective embassies in each other's nations over the course of the next two years. Uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia have not had uh, relations with each other for close to seven years, mostly because of the Yemen civil war. As many of you might know, Yemen was one of the nations that was caught up in the early days of the Arab Spring. It's a longtime dictator resigned, the vice president took power, uh, but only a couple of years later, uh, a civil war began when the Houthi minority, which is um, an offshoot of Shia Islam, took control of the capital Sana'a and then about a third of the northern part of Yemen um, and exiled the Sunni Arab government, um, the president then taking shelter in Saudi Arabia. So like so many of the wars uh, and civil wars in the Middle East over the past couple of decades, the Yemen civil war is a sectarian conflict uh, between the two main branches of Islam, uh, Sunni and Shia. And it's also a proxy war. Um, in these civil wars, the greater powers in the region tend to take a side. And so in this case, uh, the Sunni Arab monarchy in Saudi Arabia uh, supports the Sunni Arab government of, his, of Yemen and the Shia um, Persian uh, regime in Iran has taken the side of the Houthis, the Houthi rebels in Yemen. So both Saudi and Arabia and uh, Iran supporting their respective sides in the conflict. The Saudis much more directly engaged militarily, uh, conducting airstrikes against the Houthis uh, throughout about, about the past seven or eight years. Um, the Iranians, on the other hand, more subtle 
assistance to the Houthis, but still very consequential uh, training and arms, and also, most importantly, missiles. And the Houthis have used their missile arsenal provided by Iran to directly attack Saudi Arabia on multiple occasions and the United Arab Emirates, which is allied with Saudi Arabia in the conflict, um, firing those missiles into Saudi territory, striking mostly oil installations. Uh, the Saudi state oil uh, company Aramco has uh, oil fields along the eastern coast of Saudi Arabia, and they, are often, they were often attacked by the Houthis using Iranian arms. So because of that ongoing conflict, obviously Saudi Arabia and Iran not on good terms for several years. However, it looks like that possibly, at least in word, if not in deed yet, is beginning to change. Um, most of the impetus behind this change is Iran, largely because of the abysmal state of the Iranian economy. Um, because of ongoing economic sanctions, uh, imposed by Western nations and, and other factors, even including the war in Ukraine, uh, the Iranian economy is in tatters. Inflation as is at least 55%. Some economists put it at 70%. And uh, the Iranian rial, their currency, has completely tanked. It's been uh, falling in value over the past couple of years, but has completely tanked in, several, in the last several weeks. Uh, the real right now is trading in markets 600,000 reals to every one U.S. dollar. So that is how bad the Iranian economy is at the moment. So Iran has the most motivation to make peace with the wealthy uh, Saudi Arabian monarchy, and, and that's what they've managed to do. Uh, the important thing in this story to keep in mind is who brokered this deal. It wasn't the United States or any member of the EU or Russia, it was China. It was a Chinese diplomat sitting at the table between the Iranian representative and the Saudi representative on Friday that announced the deal. And this is just the latest uh, example that highlights China's growing engagement in the Middle East. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the Chinese economy has been expanding rapidly over the past about 40 years or so. Um, during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, China was very inward looking during the Cultural Revolution and the dictatorship of Mao Zedong. But in the late 1970s, that began to change as the Chinese, as Mao died, and then the Chinese economy began to pick up. The United States formalized diplomatic relations with China during the Carter administration and then signed several economic agreements with China that began to boom the Chinese economy, especially in the manufacturing sectors and in the construction and infrastructure sectors. Uh, the Chinese economy began to uh, expand rapidly, very rapidly, and needed new markets for its goods and for its services and construction. Obviously, the United States, at least on the manufacturing side, has been uh, one of those markets in the EU. Uh, but China has also found a lot of uh, partners, a lot of customers in Asia. Uh, China has embarked on a rather bold and, and uh, ambitious agenda in Asia, building what's often called the New Silk Road, uh, formerly called the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, building infrastructure, light rail, airports, seaports that stretch from China across Central Asia all the way to the Middle East and North Africa and even through Turkey up into Europe. So China has found a lot of new markets in the Middle East. Part of this uh, engagement with the Middle East is because China needs oil. China has a lot of coal reserves, but doesn't have much in the way of oil and natural gas. And so to feed its growing economic engine, it needs to find um, partners that it can buy oil and gas from at good prices while also selling those partners its goods and services. And it's found the perfect complement in Middle Eastern nations, especially Gulf nations that uh, have very little infrastructure and not much diversity in their economies, but who have lots of oil and natural gas. So last year, The Wire actually published a special report on this topic called uh, The Crescent and the Star. 
Um, I'm going to read a few portions from that report to you now. You can find it online. Just uh, Google FAI Wire Special Report Crescent and the Star, and you'll find it. Um, and there's several portions of the art article that, that give you a good context for what's happening in the Middle East right now with Chinese engagement and what the implications of it might be in the longer term, even eschatological implications um, as we approach the end of the age. It says, China's largest Mideast investment is in the Gulf states, where it has become Saudi Arabia's largest trading partner and its largest petroleum customer. Contracting the Saudis to build oil refineries inside China, which are specially designed to process Saudi crude. In other words, the Saudi's biggest customer for oil is not the United States, not the EU, not Russia, it's China. And their biggest trading partner, again, not the United States or any Western country, not Russia, but China. So much so has this cooperation grown that China has brought Saudi oil companies into China to build oil refineries that are specially designed to process Saudi crude oil. Dubai Port, United Arab Emirates, is a hub of Chinese goods. And the UAE has become China's second largest supplier of Mideast petroleum. Both Gulf kingdoms enjoy China's most highly favored trade partner status, known as comprehensive strategic partnerships. And Chinese technology firms have played a key role in the Gulf initiatives to diversify their economies away from dependence on oil and gas. For about the last decade or so, um, Gulf nations like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, especially as the United States has started producing more oil and natural gas, have found that they cannot depend on oil and gas to be their um, sole, the, the driving uh, force behind their economies that they have to diversify. So China has stepped in and provided diversification for them in the tech sector. Altogether, bilateral trade between China and Arab states reached 266 billion US dollars in 2019. So four years ago, it was that high at an annual growth rate of 9%, which is pretty high, which shows no sign of slowing in the near future. So the economic engagement between China and especially the Gulf states in the Middle East is growing, but it's not just the Arabian Peninsula. Besides the Arab states, China has also become a primary trading partner and investor in Israel to the tune of more than 16 billion US dollars in 2017, securing contracts to build light rail systems and expand Ashdod and Haifa ports and operate those ports for 25 years. So China is also building in Israel, helping them to expand their seaports and operating those ports for them, uh, contracting to do that for more than two decades. China's interest in the Jewish state has expanded beyond infrastructure to include counterterrorism cooperation, so security cooperation, and other security-related projects as well, because China has a problem with Islamic terrorism as well. At the same time, the Chinese government has also shown special consideration to Israel's arch enemy, Iran. As the economy of the Islamic Republic has buckled under the pressure of Western sanctions, China has provided an invaluable lifeline to the Ayatollahs in Tehran, signing a 25-year bilateral trade agreement in 2021, which includes Iranian oil exports to Chinese markets. China has become a primary advocate for Iran in negotiations with the United States and EU powers over the Iranian nuclear program, calling for an end to economic sanctions in return for Iran's alleged cooperation with international restrictions. So in other words, Iran has also gone to bat for, I'm sorry, China has also gone to bat for Iran on the world stage, arguing for the end of sanctions against Iran in the nuclear program, and with a wink and a nod, promising that Iran will follow the rules of the uh, nuclear agreement, and has been throwing them an economic lifeline, signing a 25-year trade agreement with Iran to keep the Iranian economy and probably the Iranian government on life support as the sanctions have continued to mount uh, from the Western world. So this may seem contradictory to, to Western minds, 
that Iran is so heavily engaged in the Middle East, both with Israel and with Iran, sort of on the opposite ends of the security spectrum. So to the Western mind, that is a contradiction. How can you support both sides in a conflict? And that's because uh, really the, the Western mindset, when it comes to geopolitics, it has a very principled anchor of diplomacy, a sense of right and wrong and good and evil, and a, a, a sort of bedrock concern for freedom, democracy, and human rights. So when we look at something like the conflict between Israel and Iran, Israel being really the best functioning democracy in the Middle East, is, unfortunately, is pretty widely on display right now um, in the national debate going on in Israel over the uh, judicial reforms, but yet is still a good example of as, how Israeli uh, democracy is at work. While on the other hand, in Iran, you see street protests being brutally repressed uh, simply because uh, young Iranian women don't want to be beaten to death when they wear their hijabs wrong. So to the Western mind, it's obvious which side of that conflict you favor. We cooperate and show public support for Israel. We give military and economic, economic support to Israel. And then we economically sanction Israel, Iran. So that is the Western approach to diplomacy and economics and military engagement. China, on the other hand, does not have, the Chinese government anyway, does not have that same approach. Uh, reading further in the article, the answer lies in the stated policies of the Chinese government, which is not interested in promoting democracy or human rights in the Middle East. That has been the intrinsic goal of Western foreign policy in the region for decades. Rather, the Chinese government is interested in maintaining balance in the Middle East, including the improvement of bilateral relations with each individual nation apart from its policies and actions towards its neighbors. Stability and security are the Chinese priority, not ideals. In other words, China doesn't care how each Middle Eastern government treats its citizens. That's not the important thing. The important thing is, is the government stable so that we can do business? The upheaval of the Arab Spring opens doors to Chinese investment, but does not provide it with long-term partnerships. Therefore, whether it's doing business with a Gulf monarch, an Israeli prime minister, or a radical supreme ayatollah, the Chinese government is only concerned with whether a state actor can play the part of a long-term trading partner. So in contrast to the West's principled moral diplomacy, the Chinese government takes a strategy of amoral diplomacy. China's amoral diplomacy and trade policy allows it to make inroads to every market across the Middle East region, regardless of the geopolitical landscape. On the other hand, principal diplomacy conversely limits Western nations from doing business with rogue governments such as Iran, Syria, and Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, as long as other nations and firms which do business with those regimes. In other words, American engagement and Western engagement in the Middle East is limited by that principal di diplomacy. We'll do business with certain governments, but not with others because they repress their people and are state sponsors of terrorism. Um, so that naturally limits Western engagement in the Middle East. I'm not arguing against that. Um, I agree with that uh, strategy and with that perspective, but just the simple fact of the matter is that that limits Western engagement in the Middle East, whereas uh, China's sort of amoral diplom diplomacy, whereas anything goes as long as we can do business together over the long term, that opens up more doors for China to be more engaged with more nations in the Middle East. Rather, the Chinese government is interested in maintaining balance. So again, the main thing is China is not interested in Israel beating Iran or Iran beating Israel. China wants both nations to be stable so that they can continue, continue doing business with both nations. So what does this mean in the long term? How does this play in um, 
to the sort of eschatological scenario that we see the Middle East moving towards. As Western nations increasingly disengage from the Middle East, and as Chinese investment in the region continues to grow on all fronts, a question arises regarding the long-term consequences and prophetic implications of such a trend. If anything, the last two decades since 9-11 have shown that the Middle East is anything but predictable. As I say, the only thing that's certain in the Middle East is that nothing's certain. And there is no biblically prophetic role for China by name. That is to say, China is never mentioned by name in the Bible. So nothing that China is doing in the, in the Middle East, I can't flip to any passage in the Bible and point to it and say, this is that. However, we do know that the general contours of the Middle East prophetic landscape at the end of the age, what they are, and there are at least two or three ways that China's increasing engagement in the region may enable the scenario. So in other words, we know at least in general contours what the Middle East is going to look like in the end time scenario, in the eschatological scenario, mostly from Daniel chapter 11. And what China is currently doing in the Middle East may be building the foundations the economic foundations, at least, and the political foundations for that future state. Number one, the substantial and rapid injection of Chinese wealth and capital into the Middle East will only continue to increase in the coming decade. And it creates the economic means by which the contemptible person, as he's called in Daniel chapter 11, also called the king of the north, He's called the Assyrian in Isaiah. He's called Gog in Ezekiel 38. He's called the beast in Revelation 13, called the Antichrist in 1 John. Uh, this capital investment in the Middle East creates the, and enables uh, that scenario described in Daniel 11, which will allow this contemptible uh, person to arise without warning and, quote, come into the richest parts of the province. So right now in the Middle East, there's not many, quote, rich parts of the province. But Chinese investment in the region is changing that. This would need to be done before conducting, before he can conduct the most successful and devastating military campaign in human history with a, quote, great army. So if this contemptible person is going to build a great army, with which he can, as it says in Daniel 11, overflow nations like a flood and pass through them and seem unstoppable for a period of time during the Great Tribulation. Great armies are built upon great infrastructure and great wealth. So again, the economic groundwork and the political groundwork being laid in the Middle East is enabling that scenario. Number two, the Chinese effort to interlink Central Asia and the northern nations of the Middle East, like Turkey, via the BRI or Belt and Road Initiative that I mentioned earlier, lays the economic groundwork for an eventual king of the north political military alliance. If that alliance encompasses the historical territory of the Greek Seleucid dynasty described in Daniel 11, it will stretch at least from Turkey to Pakistan and possibly beyond. That is, in the Daniel 11 scenario, the king of the north, the historical king of the north, Antiochus Epiphanes, ruled an empire, the Seleucid Empire, that stretched from modern-day Turkey all the way across the northern part of the Middle East, Syria and Iraq, into Central Asia, including um, Afghanistan, and down into Pakistan. So if we're expecting to see a sort of end times uh, conglomeration of ten nation, nations arise in that same general region, there would need to be this the sort of uh, infrastructure built in that region now to enable that kind of wealth and that, the building of that kind of army and the mobilization and the, and the deployment of that kind of army. That happens to be the exact region through which the Chinese government is currently building uh, its new Silk Road or a main artery of its new Silk Road through Central Asia and across the Caucasus region into Turkey and up towards the Mediterranean and Europe. So again, the infrastructure in that exact region is being constructed right now. And last of all, the post-World War II geopolitical order in the Middle East, which has previously fixed the position of Western powers in the region, especially during the Cold War, you had 
you know, the Western powers, NATO and the Soviet Union. And then after the Cold War and during the war on terror, especially the United States engaged in nation building projects, both wars and uh, construction projects in the Middle East. Uh, they were intrinsically tied to principled diplomacy, but they have been gradually replaced by an amoral and utilitarian Chinese form of real politic. That is, as Western nations have disengaged militarily and politically to a large extent from the Middle East, China has stepped in to fill the vacuum, at least politically and economically for now, possibly militarily in the future. Unconcerned with modern notions of freedom and human rights, this new Chinese Mideast dynamic allows for the rise of just such a contemptible person in the expression of his power in political consolidation and warfare, as long as it is good for business. In other words, in the sort of principled diplomacy that the United States and the West has conducted in the Middle East, such a contempt, uh, contemptible person that uh, begins wars in the Middle East, as you can read in Daniel 11, especially beginning in verse 21, um, would not have been in alignment with that sort of principled moral diplomacy. With Chinese, the sort of Chinese model of amoral diplomacy, as long as his wars of conquest bring stability and he proves himself to be a good long-term trading partner, then yet again, this is building a context in which he can eventually arise. How direct and consequential Chinese engagement in the Middle East will be in the Middle Eastern end time scenario is yet to be known. So we don't know how much it will be or when it will be, much less the timing and progression of events. However, a discerning eye in these matters will give us even more assurance as the Lord continues to arrange the pieces of the eschatological chessboard. Despite the aspirations and efforts of the nations, the Lord's end game is decided as he prepares to gather all nations together around Jerusalem for his long awaited day, our blessed hope. So again, um, friends, brothers and sisters, as we see these events taking place in the Middle East, we can see that the, the day of our salvation draws near, that the day of the Lord continues to draw near, that the Lord continues to orchestrate events uh, to bring us to that singular moment when he splits the sky and conquers the world. And so again, it is motivation for us to continue uh, watching, to continue in intercession, to continue uh, in fellowship and, and building our intimacy with the Lord, and to continue to uh, engage with him as he continues to work among the unreached, especially in the Middle East, to make disciples uh, before that day. So we love you all. Again, please join us in Dallas for the Maranatha Summit. God bless you and Maranatha.